gong. Even the church knows what we are about to see and witness in exactly two hours. We are standing right now in front of the Louvre. I'm pretty early because um, I want it to be early. I have to be early. I have to be on time. This is something that doesn't happen every year in Paris. 5th of March. It's D-Day. It's Armageddon, but the good kind. You know, the Armageddon where you're not dying of, of the world is going down, but um, something amazing is happening and it's one of a kind. And it, you will never experience it again. It's, it will just happen once. It will probably not happen again. It could happen in another 10 years. It's the 10-year anniversary of Nicolas Gesquier. Today, I mean not technically today, but today is the 10th year anniversary show. I had a glimpse inside, just a tiny bit. You see like a huge lights chandelier that is like building size. You saw lights. And if you watched my previous video where I talked about Nicolas Gasquier's Louis Vuitton time and even Balenciaga times, which you think are fundamental for contemporary fashion now, we might understand what he's trying to tell us with the, with the lights. I mean, we know he's strongly inspired by technology, but also like futuristic technology, we know out of a feeling of nostalgia. And these lights reminded me somehow of something like synapses connecting with each other, you know, like thought. It, it kind of resemblances maybe a brain and ideas and, and a physical explosion of something. So I'm, I'm so curious and I want to know so bad what is inside. So yeah, we, we will see it. Uh, we, we're speaking fall 2024 women's wear collection, the one that is designed by Nicolas Gasquier. We know he will do it another five years. We are lucky enough. <laughs> this is me speaking from a parallel universe. If you liked what you saw until now, please subscribe to the channel because it will only get better. Not gonna lie, I was shaking before the show started. Going to a Nicolas Gasquier show feels a bit like you're in a time capsule with a small window. It's a bit like watching yourself dream while well, knowing it's actually just a dream, but you still keep dreaming while you can. You don't want it to end. Or like the story, the trip to Panama from Janos. And I know you will say too, well, what are you talking about? This is a fairy tale session or what? I thought this is a fashion review video. It will make sense. It's just my associations. Um, the little tiger and bear long for a change and adventure and the city of Panama. And after a long search, they arrive at a place they find very beautiful. They think it's so beautiful. It can only be Panama and they stay there. They have completely forgotten where they came from. They have lost their way and have actually arrived at their own home. But they were only able to perceive the beauty of their beloved home once they saw it in a different context. And to me, this story sounds very emblematic of what happened here on the runway. Any passionate Gisquier fan would immediately recognize all the references. It's references of his very own work. And even though Gisquier's work has always been impressive and extraordinary, it seemed like as if this show was needed for everyone to finally understand what he has been proving four times a year for the last 10 years. He's an endangered talent and a creative for different fabrics, materials, silhouettes, finishes, entirely in the ethos of his favorite period, which is futuristic nostalgia and modern decadence. And to do justice to even the smallest details of this collection, I will be filming a separate video for this collection. Anything else would be an injustice to the collection. Just to make it clear once again why this is necessary, you don't see it due to my impeccable filming qualities, but we saw transparent round plates embedded and knitted into short leggings, knitwear that looks like boucle yarn, intricate embellishments, skirts framed in fish line to maintain the special silhouette and Louis XVI embroidered jackets, reminding us of us overtaking French aristocracy. So when I say we need a more detailed video, I mean, we need a more detailed video. So right now we're walking out of the show. At this point you might have seen the show probably. It was insane, to be honest. I was expecting it to be like an amazing sum up of the last 10 years. It was insane. It was crazy. The music, the sound, the drones, the looks. It was insane. I'm still mesmerized. 
And now we just need to get a cab quick, because right now I think like 3,000 people are trying to get a cab. Let's do. Let's go. Welcome to Fashion Week, day number two. We're starting the day with Peter Doe. One of my favorite, favorite, favorite designers from the US anyways, but also emerging, and I would still like to call it emerging, even though Mr. Doe is now the creative director of Helmut Land. I might be crying. That's not emotions. That's just the four degree weather we have here. It's March. It's okay, it can be cold, but it's fashionably cold. By the way, if you wonder what I'm wearing, which you might not, but I might just be telling you. Uh, I have this Prada coat on, old Celine boots, my favorite Magella bag where everything fits in, and something else underneath, like a mix of Magella and Uniqlo to keep the Magella warm. At the end of the day, you can wear as much Magella as you want. You will need the Uniqlo to stay warm, just FYI. So now we're going to Rue de Richelieu where the showroom is and it's just open for three hours uh, and we're lucky enough to go there and have a look. I'm really curious how his fall collection is because I'm also more of a fall person. You know, falling leaves, sadness, the beauty of the cold. No, but and he will be there personally so maybe we'll have a chance to talk to him, maybe not because Everybody wants to talk to him, I'm sure. Right now we are around Palais Royal. If that sounds something to you, but it's a beautiful area. You might know it from Cafe Kitsune. It's sad, but Cafe Kitsune is the famous cafe here. On my right, behind me, there is Cafe Kitsune. Yeah, that's a Paris attraction actually. So, we're going. We're walking. While entering the showroom, I figured immediately that Peter Doe has taken the best decision to open up a showroom this season and not have a runway. Because there's something that is essentially different about him that differentiates him from many other designers. Many brands need their story. They own it and use it to make themselves understood and maybe more interesting. There's nothing wrong with that. It's better to understand the design decisions based on their source of inspiration, of course. And in the case of Peter Doe, we know the source of inspiration as well. He spent his childhood and some of his early youth in Vietnam, a country of distinct culture, warmth and history. And nothing sounds more romantic than a child's story of days spent in nature and feeding chickens. However, the reality is usually very different. A happy childhood can quickly lead to ignorance and insecurity. The Fall Winter Collection runs under the title Ao Das, which stands for a transformative classical Vietnamese garment that can be pulled over pants or dresses like a skirt. In Peter Do's case, we know the relevance of family. The only thing you have left when you leave your home country. This collection is an ode to the grandmother. And what is even more interesting about this collection is that it no longer needs a story. It no longer needs an explanation. Inspirations don't need to be even explained by him. The clothes speak that much for themselves. From now on, the techniques do the explaining, the handwork, the fabric selection, the workmanship. Peter Do no longer needs a background. In the moment, in the now, everything he does speaks for itself and surpasses all convictions. He doesn't have to be put in context to be valuable. His work, as it is, is very valuable. A dévoré dress and probably the most contemporary finish is perhaps reminiscent of his grandmother's mourning, but leaves enough scope to enjoy the delicacy of the fabric manipulation he has done. And as always, Peter Do shows without showing, elegance without saying it. The elegance appears almost down to earth in contrast to its extreme form due to the quality of workmanship. Here we see again how important it is to look carefully at Peter Do's designs. Any skimming leads to essential seams or darts on jackets, the valuable workmanship of the interior to be lost. In this collection, Peter appears more relaxed, romantic and organic as we're used to, a contrast to his strictly constructed and sharp cuts we saw before. And what is fascinating this time is the multifunctionality of the collection. Almost every piece can be worn in multiple ways. This criterion is almost the opposite of the usual luxury designs, where practicality is usually secondary. 
a vest with a gauze-like train wrapping around the back like a protective motorcycle vest, which then closes under the bodice like a classical vest. If you pull the vest over the skirt, you could almost see some Magella inspiration, but it has been implemented the Peter Doe way. Rarely has a piece of clothing been brought into so many different forms with such finesse as here. From skirt to vest with train, the same in reverse or even as a veil. Wool pants, which falsely look to the eye just like wool pants, but they're actually knitted with such finesse that you have to look twice to recognize it. The new serenity of the collection is also due to Peter's newly introduced silhouettes. Known for his stringent, slim, yet comfortable shapes, he brings the oversized form into this new collection. A knit coat with typical deconstruction elements in different colors already pointed out to me a future bestseller. And I like the trousers too, a lot. Hello, we just came out of the showroom right now and honestly every time I see uh, Peter Doe's tailoring, his commitment to details and quality and fabrics he creates himself, we don't have that. And this doesn't exist. This does, what he's creating does not exist among any emerging designer. And I will not call Peter Do an emerging designer anymore because that's just rude. Um, he gives us the quality of a hundred year old heritage house. You know what? We don't even get that from the heritage houses. The love for details, it's not only love, you know, love can also mean it's not perfectly manufactured. But here we just get a degree of quality that doesn't exist anywhere else. The details, so intricate, so delicate. The fabrics, I'm just, I'm out of words. I don't know how to describe it at this point. And I do believe that a lot of brands this week will disappoint me now that I've seen this. And the great thing here, the great thing here about the showroom was that finally, uh, we did justice to Peter because everybody was able to see everything close up and not only the buyers that buy it at the end uh, for their stocks, but also people like you and me. And this is something I figured also before actually, because I was aware of his designs and quality, that you don't see that on the runway at all. Like you, you, you just sense in some sort the, the quality and the fabrics, but you have no idea what is happening inside. Everything inside has the most highest form of lining. This you need to touch, you need to look at it close up, you need to touch it, you need to feel it. Um, he had pants that were made out of knitwear that looked like fabric. It looked like not a normal wool, it looks like, hey, this is wool, but it looks different. And then he just told me, it's knit. He said it's knit, just like the coat. I need to eat something now because that was too much. That was that was just too much for me right now. So let's grab a sandwich. Hi guys, it's me again. What a surprise, right? Uh, we're now walking to the Sakai show. We're a bit early, which is good because usually we're almost late. And it's not because I'm important and I'm like, ah, I'm too late to anything. But the shows are really like so quickly after each other. Everything starts like an hour late. It's crazy. Like you almost never manage to be on time. Um, so, we have the Sakai show, I'm really curious again, of course, how the show will look like, oh, designed by Shitsosa Abe. I think there's a kind of a shift in the last years that we've seen within her designs. It used to be, I think, a bit more sportive and more functional. And I think what's very like distinct about her is like, everybody deconstructs and the thing that she always uses, like different fabrics, like poplin uh, fabrics, shirts with like, extreme nylon fabrics, combines them to these together, is like kind of the opposite of deconstruction. I feel like she's reconstructing these together because it doesn't have this messy appeal of the other brands that deconstruct. It's not like, look how messy we are. We put all these weird fabrics together that don't fit at all, but then she puts it together and fits perfectly somehow. So it doesn't really feel deconstructed, but it is deconstructed. And if you look at the last shows, it's way more dark. We saw even denim. If you go into the stores, you see a lot of khaki, which is still one of her strongest features, I think. I love, I love everything nylon that she does. 
So, this is the Women's Wear Fall Winter 24 collection. Let's see how it will go if I don't die crossing the street. And let's go stand in line. That's the video of fashion. Yesterday I talked to someone who works with a brand and we've been to the show and he said, I worked on this event for six months and uh, okay. and the show was honestly 10 minutes, eight minutes. And it's like six months of work, so much work for such a short show. But that's kind of the beauty of fashion, it's just a lot of effort and a lot of a lot of work. We love it. So we're sitting at the brand that Tim Blanks likes to call Quantum Physics. And she herself just says fabrics and concept indicate where the design is usually going. The effect of the garments is the highest priority for Chitose. Chitose Abe's story is a little different than you might expect, which is ultimately due to her strong character. After eight years of Reika Wakubo and Junya Watanabe school, one would think that the stylistic influence is inevitable for a new avant-garde design. And however, sometimes the influence just remains hidden in the theoretical realization rather than the practical. Comme des Garçons is known for taking its work very seriously. And so seriously that it can almost seem as if individual emotions can get easily suppressed. This is probably why we wait impatiently for the new Sakai collection all the time. Her tireless enthusiasm, not in the classic sense, in a form of euphoria or anything, but in form of comfort, functionality and uniqueness. Uh, Chitos says in an interview, which is probably almost 10 years ago in Gentlewoman magazine, that she loved to wear special clothes as a child, which her mother could sew for her and make her stand out all the more. In this collection, Sakai shows you how you can be in line with others, inconspicuous, but as soon as you move a little, it becomes apparent that you are wearing something very special. It's almost an illusion that people need to figure out and find out about you. We see constructed jackets that are brought together in such a way that it almost looks as if they're slipping down. We have morph jackets of almost cubist proportions, fringed cuts in outerwear shirts that look very robust and functional, but if you look more closely, you can see a little romantic lace peeking out between the folds. Something very typical for Chitosi, who loves to include some femininity in the harshness. Chitosi's main focus here remains the play with volume, shape and radical fusion of disparate textiles and designs, which ultimately make up her very famous and loved design language. The collection consists entirely of dresses. The reason why this is not noticeable is that she has brought all the pieces and details together in such a way that it is almost invisible that it's mostly single pieces. The high boots are almost camouflaged, wrapped in tuxedo pant fabrics. Another illusion that at first makes us think the Sakai woman might have maybe grown up, but then just proves otherwise and shows that no, the Sakai woman has just become very smart and sophisticated. And the best thing about it is that Sakai is always one step ahead. Sophistication is of course important, especially in the current zeitgeist, but she shows how we do it in the right way staying visibly, comfortably refined. So the show has ended. Probably I will have included here some notes about the show. I took, I took some notes as well. We saw a lot of dresses, a lot of like, not deconstructed, but again, a lot of different materials attached to each other, turned into dresses, a lot of volumes. I think a big topic about volumes and boots, huge boots, boots that look like pants. Yeah, more like pants actually. And no, I love that she had these tiny collars. It was velvet, it was silky, and it was popping out in like extreme colors in contrast to, to the looks that were mainly like more navy, brown, beige, the, two, the typical colors for Sakai. Um, and it was a beautiful venue that had this light game around. It was really nice. No, it was a really cool show. So right now we are on the bridge, Pont Alexandre III. Underneath here was the Magella show, if you might remember. Like right down under this bridge was the Ma uh, Martin Magella Couture show that we still have in our hearts. And here, if you look there, oh my god, I'm a tour guide also, is the Grand Palais, where we see usually very often, let me, let me be a tour guide. To my right here, we see Grand Palais, where you usually have the Chanel shows, like, yeah, very big shows. I, was, I mean, it's a... It's a big venue, so yeah, usually it's the Chanel shows. I don't know who else shows here, to be honest. 
but it's also just a beautiful palace. Yeah, it's giving Paris. It's giving Paris in all manners. I love this area here. It's it's very touristic, but it's also just beautiful. And underneath this bridge, it's not Topic Sakai, but it's funny because there are like these tiny bars, like these forbidden bars you can imagine from the 18th, 19th century. And that's where Magella was shown. It was beautiful to have these neon lights and contrast and this light game that they had. So it started like with these very muted green tones with these neon lights and then suddenly like before the show started they turned like ultra white but you know the white that you get into your face when you're at your dentist place but it was beautiful because it was also it felt like some kind of awakening like you needed to wake up you know like it got I'm on the biker lane not trying to get killed that was cool honestly that, that your eyes hurt a second before you see the pieces I like effects like these you know it's of course it's a fashion that you see on the runway at the end that counts and we love very small venues and everything as well but if you have the chance to create something impactful emotional and even physically changing your mood like for example something like light that's amazing if that's if that's included as well we had that here that was very cool and an amazing start for the show and currently we're going to Marine Serre. Yeah, I'm really curious how this show is as well because Marine Serre, as you might know, was a LVMH uh, prize winner back then. Uh, she's very well known like for her recycled fabrics, garments that she patches together and also for her Half Moon uh, logo that got her, catapulted her into fame. I'm not sure how much we will see this now anymore but uh, I'm really curious if she will implement that logo and the recycled upcycling topic and stuff. So let's see how that will look like. And we're continuing with Marine Serre's ground control. The show took place not far from the Gare de Lyon, an old freight station like building that is currently in the hands of, I would say, postmodern art, music, and food fans. Dressed up in the crescent moon logo, the food booth stood as ever as a showcase for the runway. In the middle of the runway, there was a small but effective and above all, strongly good smelling pizza corner. Equipped with pizza chefs in head to toe marine cell crescents, they began to expand their pizza dough simultaneously with the show. Hence the theme of the Marine Serre Café collection. In no way this was an abstract name, it was pretty literal. Uh, welcome to the Marine Serre Café, as acclaimed on the tiny tables surrounding the runway, or maybe better, Marine Serre Market, because that's what it felt like due to some stylistic choices on the models. We had the pleasure to experience the Fall Winter Collection, the overachiever who worked under Sarah Burton, Raph Simmons and Demna, and is the inventor of the Crescent, of the Crescent logo that has burned itself into everyone's heads once launched on bodysuits in 2018, if you might remember. With her early dedication to elevating clothing, standing out not with her choice of fabrics but her expression, she managed to set the direction of a sporty and avant-garde inspired brand very early on. Her own athletic background was probably an effective inspiration here, but as we know, the wearability of her pieces is a big priority for her. The half-moon jerseys on patchwork smocking, finished with voluminous taffeta sleeves and trains, hinted at an eclectic and modern take of the familiar chic evening gown. And the wildly creative use of secondhand fabrics allowed the elegant shoulders to be covered with floral silks in a look that hinted at vintage silk scarves from days gone by, as well as the potentially creative art session of a teenager draping her mother's old silk scarves into a dress. Strongly influenced by the idea of a street cast, the models in their almost grouped looks looked like anyone you might meet on the streets of Paris. The final runway of the models alone clearly indicated that Marine Serre had followed the idea of a community and society when creating these designs. No look worked actually alone. There were always two or three models who belonged to a group, almost a clique. We had girls, boys, ladies, mothers, fathers, brothers. Everyone should walk the streets of Marine Serre even models that looked strongly alike with Kate Moss and it became national news, but it was just a look-alike. Here she showed again how much she loves the freedom of different personalities. Within the club or the corporate job, Marine had the disruptive look ready to represent the creative and above all, always real look. So, 
last venue of the day, we're in front of Coperni. There are already a lot of fans of the brand outside. Uh, we're a bit early because we're early birds and we want to be on time. Um, really interesting, we're outside of Paris in Aubervilliers, which is a atypical venue location, I would say, but it's also like huge. So I think it can get huge, huge. And there is important people coming. As you might remember, the last show was like a huge thing with a dress construction on the runway itself and it was it went viral and the brand has gained a lot of popularity since and especially the handbags accessories and it's a very viral brand I would say so let, I think they will have something crazy I saw on their Instagram already that they had something a jiggly Coperni swipe bag I think we will see some exciting technology stuff because they said it's like a NASA technology handbag which is crazy we might also have a little look what it looks like when people wait like here yeah and that's what it's like it's pretty cold and it's like 15 minutes before the show starts but I think I will already stand in line I, I think there is actually no line it's just literally pe people waiting outside which is I get it you know there are in interesting people out there there are interesting styled people out there so you have something to look at but it's crazy that so many people came outside, like in this cold weather, outside of Paris to watch the guests, actually. And I think the celebrities. This is a celebrity show, so that's why they're here. Let's go. Let's, let's stand in line and see if we find our seat. Everything started with the sound we know of Steven Spielberg's movie, Close Encounters of the Third Kind from 1977. Overall, every tiny bit of the collection was somehow correlating with the idea of sci-fi. From the huge monolith in the middle of the venue reminding us all of the infamous 2001 A Space Odyssey scene, this time without the apes but models surrounding it, with hair slicked back, not with hairspray but a slime-like look that reminded me of the 1979 film classic Alien with Sigourney Weaver, or the whole collection was a treasure for sci-fi fans who have a thing for an apocalyptic outcome. Mini dresses made out of tiny foil-like fabrics referencing foil hats and those less bigger fans of the sci-fi Armageddon, I would say. Anno Vaillant and Sebastian Meyer build a show of minimalistic, wearable, yet emblematic pieces surrounded by conspiratorial imagery. If one ever wanted to play in a contemporary post-apocalyptic movie, this was the moment. From star-shaped heels to the Matrix referencing bodysuits, ready to get life energy soaked out of the tiny metal studs, but of course only if you decided to swallow the blue pill. It would not have been a Coperni show if there wouldn't be one big exposition. The swipe bag as we know it, but made out of silica aerogel, a nanomaterial used by NASA to capture stardust. And yes, I know this all sounds very scientific and far away from fashion, but sometimes it's exactly about that, how far fashion can really go. So, today is Uma Wang Day, and I'm super curious, it's also the first time ever that I have the chance to see it live. And I always loved the designs, uh, because it's, there is something more important than me speaking. Um, I always loved the designs because she manages to build up a brand on functionality and uh, military inspiration and cover it in the ethereal form of beauty. You see that especially in her prints. She has very distinct prints that she uses in her textiles and fabrics that is not very typical for other designers. You usually have a prominent shade range of like khakis and dark beige tones, brown tones. It's, it's pretty interesting and to me it goes a bit into the direction of I mean, it's not avant-garde, it's definitely not avant-garde, it's also functional fashion, but to me it has this core inspiration of old school, vintage, recapsulated in a modern form and modernized with certain prints, so it's, it's very interesting. Um, we're on Georgia Sank, I think, and the venue should be very close. It's in the American Cathedral, which is a beautiful architecture. Let's have a look. Uma Wang is known for her historical references, 
But even if she's inspired by Pompeii, the Tang Dynasty, or Venice, it is usually not a one-to-one -one reference of inspiration. It is a feeling, it is a color, a surface, or a structure. Her requirements for fabrics are unparalleled, their structure almost realistic. In an earlier interview about the previous Pompeii collection, she shared how she asked a fabric manufacturer how to make a fabric look like a speckled wall because she had seen one just like it on site in Pompeii. As abstract as many thoughts are, they can also be ultra-realistic. Her often nature-bound color choices of khakis to browns and muds always reflect the naturalness but also show a form of nostalgia at the same time, as if there was dust on the paint she uses. One big source of inspiration for her is the art of textile artist Maria Lai, whose poetic artwork consists of non-didactic threads leading through books that are being threaded in emotionally traditional ways with an important message. I just recommend everyone to read into that artist specifically. Uma Wang has created a new feeling in this collection, one that we have not seen from her before. The collection is called Memorabilia, which means objects that are collected or kept because of their memory and association. And each look in this collection is like a surreal memory, like a dream that seemed logical when it was dreamed, but now after waking up and going through the exact elements of that dream, seems like a surreal or irrational dream. Uma Wang says in her press note that she had a quest for less. She is not talking about minimalism here. Her expectations of fabrics is still highly specific and extraordinary. However, if you look at the shapes of the dresses and coats, we see an absence of the unnecessary, perhaps. Sleeves on coats intertwined with cape-like coats, which nevertheless allow the hands to slip out through the front pocket openings. And despite numerous wearable looks, the idea of the dream remains intact. Dresses consisting of cushions suggest human outlines, but this actually only serves as a support for the cushions, which are ultimately intended to form the actual silhouette. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. So first of all, uh, congratulations to the collection. I think it's a beautiful evolution that we see throughout the years within your collections. A lot of historical references you're inspired by, ethereal, inspirations as well but still you always keep these very strong structural forms that also still are kind of flowy so it doesn't give the harshness that we're used to see from other brands who are very structural you manage to create um, very strong and bold forms while still being very light and this is something i think it's exceptional about you do you think this is kind of your ethos or is this what is like the fundament of creating these big shapes and these bold shapes and so still normally, making it light so normally we don't do the shape like this mm. normally people are thinking uma wang always romantic yeah, yeah. but uh, this time we really wanted to to use the fabric because it's a fabric it's too much personality too much history so we want to build the modern shape to the future, so that's why we're working a lot for the it was very yeah for the silhouette, the shape, also the um, construction. Was, it, was yeah. it very fabric focused this time? Because I saw beautiful wool yeah. fabrics that looked we like it's kind of mohair. Like, uh, we, yes. we always try different fabric, but each different fabric is have a strong personality. Yes. So we wanted to make them a more a future, you know, because yes. the, the fabric actually always influenced from the past. So You're they right, already yeah. have carried so many history, and texture. Then you bring it to the so future. I don't want to use the same things, you know, oh to build okay. the more heavy history. This is, this is mind blowing yeah, right so, now, now that you see yeah, it. Yeah, so I wanted to make li limited, really limited shape, simple one, but mm -hmm. a strong. Beautiful. strong and uh, how to say to make the woman is come from form. another it's world. It's a new form, you know, yeah, like it's, it's a, a modern form. approach yeah. of the historical patterns. Yeah, but with the very traditional yes. uh, fabric. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. okay, that's yeah. that's mind-blowing. Thank you yeah, so much. Thank for you. Taking After a little form pre-pause consisting of a coconut snack and water, we're now in front of Nicola Pascaletti, uh, also a very interesting emerging designer uh, who is nominated for the LVMH prize now and we're going to look at his fall winter collection uh, he's famous for like genderless and also body morphing forms a lot of symbolism and also medieval signatures I would say so that's something that is very distinct about him and I'd really like to see how it looks like Seeing this collection makes it easy to understand why Niccolo Pascal that he's nominated for the LVMH prize Probably more than anybody else, he managed to create a distinct design language for himself that lets us immediately recognize his pieces. And one of them is the horizontal white cut on pants in the middle of the thigh length 
Not only does it bring some comfort, I guess, it also creates an illusion of a pant that could also turn into a skirt if you want. And comfort and silhouette seem to be the main focus of Niccolo, while presenting for the first time ever the most wearable form of his abstract designs and shapes. Coats with cut off arms ready to show off the contrasting white of a cotton shirt underneath, or the gigantic wooden beds and pearls knit into skirts like armors, tin foils shaping and draping skirts from long to short, and multiple armhole sleeved knits that give you the choice to wear it as a cape or just as a stylistic choice because you want to. With Niccolo Pascaletti's design, one always feels like it's a look into historical days, but this time it looked like there has been a little time travel into the future. So first of all, amazing uh, collection you showed, and I think it's very different than the previous collections you had. Um, your inspirations are sometimes very ethereal, sometimes even medieval, so new forms we don't see so often, and maybe not the typically functional forms. But this collection, I recognize that you had more tailor wear, more structured clothes. So this kind of shifted a bit. It, it got a bit more serious and grown up, I felt, and almost a bit more functional as well, but still keeping your ethos of this beautiful, ethereal and um, flowing uh, forms that you have and silhouettes. Did you think, do you think you grew up and something changed or shifted a bit? Um, well, I, I think um, it has been exciting to, to explore uh, more and more the, the idea of, of a wardrobe, for sure, and something that feels uh, grounded in reality, I feel like, since last season. But at the same time, I feel um, I feel there was there were a lot of like abstract pieces, and it was interesting to find a way to integrate them with the, with more like classic ones. I feel like the idea is always has been starting from a wardrobe um, concept, um, but there like it's always with a twist. And I feel like with this collection, um, we really wanted to blend a sort of a futuristic aspect with something that really was reminiscent of the mm -hmm. past. Um, it was really a blend of, I feel, ages, um, in times, in history, mm -hmm. and thinking about the future as well. Yeah. yeah, this was very visible and beautiful. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thanks for your time. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you. So I just had the chance to speak with Niccolo, which is super rare and very cool that he took the time to, to answer my question. And I just figured that there was a change and evolvement in his design, which I think is amazing at going in a grown-up direction. And he just answered it. And it's, it's beautiful to see a designer, you know, like throughout the years. And I really hope the best for him for the LVMH prize as well. So let's go up. Starting with the collection O oh Lovely One, Girl That Fell From a Star by Rosine Pierce. From Michelle Lamy for Marfa Magazine to Alexa Chung for the In Honor of Carl Met Gala in 2023, Rosine Pierce, an acclaimed designer from Ireland, delves into the rich tapestry of craftsmanship intertwined with the historical narrative of Irish women. Recognized for her talent, she has garnered prestigious accolades such as the Chanel Métier d'Art Design Award and the Prix du Public for her debut collection showcased at the IA Festival. Um, I guess you might remember the IA Festival where artists of fashion, photography and accessories are being prized. Her creative vision is centered around exploring innovative approaches to the zero waste cutting and construction methods and embracing sustainability, Pierce breathes new life into materials through practices like dead stock upcycling and material recycling and thereby creates captivating textures in her designs. And with a commitment to preserving traditional techniques, her collections meticulously crafted locally in Ireland, honoring the heritage of skilled artisans. While having a moment speaking to her later at Dover Street Market as well, she explained to me how the creative procedure of her design works. It is interesting to understand how the trained technique of an apprenticeship ultimately determines your design process. The design student starts with a sketch and lets it result in a garment, which is planned in advance. The tailor implements it straight away on the model and immediately sees how the design will ultimately look. The textile designer pays attention only to the fabric in his hand. The manipulation of the fabric completely determines the design result. And if we didn't know about Rosine's process finesse, we might not be able to explain the endless beauty of the natural asymmetry, which is the result of an emotional process of textile abrasion. 
without giving too much away, because you'll see in a moment how I'm going to ask Raisin two little questions. The color of her choice in every collection she has shown so far is white. White stands for innocence, childhood, purity, femininity. At the same time, the fact that she chose white has another very important effect on the collection, and you will find that out in like two minutes. In the textile manipulation that Rosine performs, incidentally trained by her mother and also teaching other people about the technique of knitting to maintain the decades-old culture, she performs different techniques at once with the garments. Multiple smockings surrounded and decorated with handmade needle embroidery create star-like formations, which if you look at the title of the collection are perhaps also meant to represent a small constellation of stars maybe. Smockings of different sizes indicate the individual working process that Rosin talks about when she says, first the fabric, then the piece. So first of all, congratulations to this beautiful collection that you just showed us in the Irish Embassy in Paris. Um, it's interesting to see that you get inspired by a lot of repeating things like femininity, innocence, heritage as well, but you still kind of evolve it in a very modern interpretation. What is it that you want to tell us when you show us these very feminine, flowy, innocent looks, but at the same time you manage to create these very strong looking, very independent and fierce looking uh, girls and you still use the color white overall the most. Mm -hmm. What is the importance of the color white for you? What does it stand for? Mm -hmm. And what is it that makes you jump from heritage? And I know that you uh, care a lot about crochet, you teach uh, people uh, how to do that, so you care about that. And then you uh, jump a step and uh, show it in a more modern way. Like what's the importance of that for you? few questions. <laughs> um, Sorry. No, it's fine. No, I, I love it. Um, well, I guess with each collection, they all have their own intent. But overall, what we try to do is that we love to embrace the femininity. We love to embrace um, things that were classically traditional, craft, craft that is dying out, and but show them, as you say, in ultra modern ways. So although we might be, you know, the crochet is crochet, but is utilizing them. So for this season, what was quite new at what we did was that we, the joining and the difference in the crochet and the smocking, and they become almost like live sculptures, but around the body, um, these bodices and these bustiers, and it really showed the female body, unlike before, that I feel like we really have. Um, hitting back on the, the Irish culture and heritage is just an interest of mine, like, like many things, and I just find myself coming back and referencing, I mean, within the collection there's a lot of thinking behind and gently referencing these things that um, have been on my mind, essentially. Yeah, no, that's beautiful. Now that you mentioned smoking, I just figured again, like, that was, like, it's intricate design, it's beautifully chosen, and it's not like the smoking we're used to see usually that is, like, very symmetrical or something, right. but it seemed like a very emotional selection of smokings, of where it's supposed to be. Uh, I love the one on a pant on the back of it, where it was like, okay, that's an interesting place for smoking, but it looked so beautiful and kind of, I don't know, it looked very sensitive also chosen. Thank you so much. Um, well, yeah, a lot of it very, very considered. I mean, we have, as again, with the white, it allows us to really concentrate on all the textures, all the details, mm -hmm. all the embroidery within the smocking, um, patchworking, and playing with transparency. So I guess it has been a really great design tool, as well as touching on that purity that we love to go back mm -hmm. to. But again, um, it really is femininity, but also, as you say, with strength. It's showing strength within the ultra-feminine. Mm -hmm. Cool, very nice. And you're right, also choosing white gives you the option to see so many different kinds of white as well. Uh, that's a beautiful effect actually of choosing just one color mainly, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> so, hello, hello, hello. I don't know where we will see this part. As you can see, it's Paris Fashion Week that I'm very curious about as Vaquera, the New York City-based brand. And it's raining. Cats and dogs, it's fucking cold, but we can still take the metro. So now we're going to Vaquera, which is uh, still, it's not really an emerging brand, as you know, it's over 10 years old, but still uh, one, a very disrupted DIY inspired, kind of avant-garde brand that is anti-establishment, I would say. So that's pretty cool. I can't wait. And now I'm so cold and I'm a bit late. So I'm going to rush. 
The saddest part of sharing this clip without sound here with you is not being able to share the energy that Vaquera captivates whenever they let models run down the runway. It's probably not the essence of what they do, but it's part of their very theatrical shows. The brand of the two designers, Brian Taubensee and Patrick DiCabrio, who for more than 10 years now fight for their visualized idea of styling and fashion, have usually something very strong to say. It's not political or staged, it's usually something very honest and sincere that affects them so much that a hyped up, aggressive, cynic and almost humoristic fashion show can be the result of it. In this collection it was the topic money. And after food and health, the most human need that we all have in common and that the design duo had to struggle with way too much. Not thinking about money is a bit like not thinking of a pink elephant. It's, it's there and it will always affect every decision taken in one's life. Little dollar prints were hanging down a model's neck that was fully dressed in a leather set, reminding us of maybe better vintage days. Another model wore a tight bodysuit fully occupied by dollars. And while the theme party maintained, the Vaquera Wera can now find herself in more multiple sets of grown-up clothing. The iconic humor maintains, of course, with Madonna-inspired comb bras, slips attached on the back of the skirts or the X-ray dessous on the shirt. But we also get wool pants, leather sets, motorcycle coats now. Uh, Vaquera is definitely not in the mood to grow up, but their clothes give us a chance to dip your toe into their world and still stay yourself now. Hello, 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 hello. Welcome back from the last day of Paris Fashion Week. Currently we're in the Palais de Tokyo. You might know it. Uh, it's one of the most famous contemporary museums in Paris and it's also the place where a lot of shows are being shown. I think I should... I'm not that girl. I'm not keeping my glasses on inside. And you might know it if you're not that well aware of Palais de Tokyo. Uh, outside is a place where Rick is always showing, except for the last two seasons. He wants to make a change, he said. We need to be quick. I'm sure it will not start on time, which is very normal for Fashion Week, but um, it's supposed to start in like two minutes. And we were looking at Zoma today. And honestly, it's a very, very interesting new brand uh, with a designer duo. You might know Imru, the famous stylist. He's one of the duo and I love their color collection, uh, color selection. I like their forms. It's uh, a very interesting brand with like very contemporary feminine forms and interesting fabrics. Last season I looked um, in Dover Street Market in their showroom at the pieces and this time we see the show. I think it's pretty cool. Okay. Without putting Zoma too much into a box, but just to let you know, Zoma also means summer in Dutch. And after their successful debut show for the Spring 23 in Paris show, everybody was waiting for the design duo's newest explosion of happiness. Imru Asha, one of the two founders, established himself within the last years as one of the most relevant stylists in the industry, who is artistically direct and dazed. And Daniel Aitoganov, who has a long list of experience from Chloe to Tisci and now Louis Vuitton men's. The compilation of experience and knowledge is here not an accident. The two friends had the idea of founding their brand almost years ago, but decided to go separate ways to gain more experience, which sounds like a very smart decision to me. The distinct Zoma design is not a simple form of joy and color. It's a very smart yet emotional selection of color and form. Contrasting colors that get infused with functionality, eternity dresses in the most reasonably wearable way without feeling like an avant-garde cleric that takes itself maybe too seriously. One less of a design choice, but a very important atmospheric one that's typical for the doer's inevitable talent, the choice of sound and music. The shoes were bedded with tiny coral or even sweets like beds, creating a beautifully natural sound while walking, adding to the sound of the emblematic pompons on the model's shoulders. Clearly it was just a styling choice, but it created a unique sound experience that one couldn't help but feel enchanted with watching the models walk. And it's unbelievable, but it's a wrap. Thank you so much if you watched till the end. I hope I could give you some insights about brands and designers and you find this somehow beneficial for yourself. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you did find this beneficial. Don't forget to join the Discord server where we are a lot of weirdos and happy people talking about fashion. And follow me on Instagram. All the links are down below. See you very soon, aka next week. Love you. Bye.